Welcome to the webinar, Shock Chlorination, What You Should Know. I'm Cliff Tryans, Director of General Public Outreach for the National Groundwater Association. It is my privilege to introduce our presenter. Jeff Williams is a master groundwater contractor, the highest level of certification available to water well system professionals. He also is a certified vertical closed loop driller for geothermal heat pump systems. Jeff helps operate Spafford and Sons water wells in Jericho, Vermont. He also is a former president of the National Groundwater Association. During the presentation, feel free to type questions in the question box. At the end of Jeff's presentation, he will answer your questions. Also at the end of the presentation, we will make a handout of the presentation available for downloading. This webinar is provided by the National Groundwater Association and the Rural Community Assistance Partnership with support from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And without further delay, I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Cliff. That was a, a nice introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today to present the webinar on uh, shock chlorination, what you need to know. This is one in a series of webinars provided by the Rural Community Assistance Partnership and the National Groundwater Association with support from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. There's a lot of things that go into uh, making a water supply safe and also uh, the safety of those that are, that are applying the practice. So we're going to cover quite a little bit of stuff here today and uh, hopefully uh, it'll answer a lot of the questions and uh, you know take take uh, you know some of the guesswork out of uh, uh, what you should do with your supply and how it should be properly treated. Most of this today will deal with uh, uh, drilled wells, uh, water wells, but this certainly applies to shallow wells also as far as the concentrations of of chlorine required uh, and the application process. So shock chlorination is a term uh, loosely applied to using a relatively high concentration of chlorine to disinfect a well system. And what happens is, uh, get my slides around here for just, you know, just a second. Uh, shock chlorination, we're talking about 50 to 200 parts per million uh, of free chlorine. And that's a lot of chlorine. That's really, really heavy. So we get to the next slide. It may come as a surprise to you that the National Groundwater Association does not recommend household well owners attempt to disinfect their own wells. And we'll cover several reasons through this presentation of why this is true. Rather, NGWA recommends well owners use a water well system professional familiar with proper well disinfection procedures to do the job. So the, some of the reasons uh, at, right out of the gate here that NGWA recommends well owners use a water well system professional. Number one is the safe handling of strong chlorine solutions takes Proper safety precautions also. The safety and health of our customers and employees are our first concern. And as a business owner, OSHA has strict criteria regarding the safe use of corrosive products. Chlorine is a corrosive product. Chlorine has uh, a number of ways that it can affect you, uh, whether it's your skin, whether it's your eyes, whether it's inhalation, uh, any of those exposures. Many people, we probably have all used Clorox in our daily lives, uh, some sort of bleach. I probably shouldn't talk about brand names, uh, you know, household, common household bleach to disinfect things. And that's a sodium hypochlorite. We'll kind of go into what the differences are here in just a little bit. Uh, so there is both concentration levels and safety factors uh, that, that guide the use of these products when you're disinfecting a, uh, a well supply. As you can see in this next photo, 
there, there are some volumes. Uh, there are methods that are used that are uh, more favorable than other methods. Uh, there are things that you should do uh, in order to be thorough in this disinfection process. So the, some of the steps, being multiple steps, you need to know what the volume of water in your well is. So how deep is the well, or do, whether it's a dug well or a drilled well or wherever it is, how, what is the volume that you need to, to treat? Because there's a, a minimum level of free chlorine that's going to be needed in order to, to properly uh, kill the bacteria. Minerals take up chlorine uh, as well as uh, chlorine is dissipated into the air. So you have a number of places where it can be lost before it even gets to what you're trying to treat. And in a, a water well, uh, we typically drill a six inch well here, a gallon and a half to the foot, a 400 foot well is 600 gallons. So we're treating a fair amount of water uh, when we're disinfecting this because we have, to, we have to treat the whole volume of water in the well as well as the volume in the house. And then we need to make sure we get it through everywhere in order to have contact, the chlorine have contact with the bacteria in order to kill it. So as we go down through, certainly, you know, our, our volumes uh, uh, find out the, uh, the amount of bleaching powder required. Uh, two and a half grams of good quality bleaching powder would be required to disinfect a thousand liters of water. So, you know, what are we talking, 200, 250 gallons of water. When you get into more than that, uh, you get into the 600 gallon or 800 gallon or 1,000 gallon uh, wells that we are required to disinfect, then uh, to get 50 parts per million uh, in 600 gallons of water is going to take about a half a pound of 65% uh, calcium hypochlorite. And that's a fair amount of, of, of chlorine uh, in order to get it to 50 parts per million, and that's without any of the other losses. So, you know, there, there are a number of steps to go through. There are a number of calculations to, do, to be done, as well as the methodology used, uh, the procedures that we use to do it. And for the untrained per, uh, person, there are multiple opportunities to make a mistake that could either render the disinfection ineffective, create additional problems, or create some sort of a personal health concern because we're dealing with something that that is is, is uh, uh, got some real safety issues with it when you're handling products of this nature. So there may be circumstances when a well owner cannot get a water well system professional to disinfect the well. So for instance, someone who lives in a remote area where service is not readily available. My guess is, is that this probably isn't the case very often. Uh, most water, most parts of this country have a water well professional or multiple groundwater professionals or health department, uh, whether it be a county, uh, local or state health officials that could uh, send out the, a document uh, with procedures to be able to follow that, that have both the calculations required uh, per 100 gallons to disinfect the supply. And also, I, I would consider the safety part of it. Uh, I know the Vermont Department of Health has guidelines for you know, disinfecting your water supply. They have guidelines for taking water samples and those kind of things. Uh, so, you know, if in extreme, I'm going to say extreme in rare cases, where you can't get somebody out there to do it, that there are some guidelines to be able to do it yourself. Uh, um, it, it's a kind of a tough call as a business person to try to talk someone through a disinfection process uh, with, you know, considering, you know, maybe the liability of uh, giving them uh, guidance that they didn't understand or something like that. So we're pretty careful about those kind of things, but the state agencies uh, have really uh, thorough documents in some areas of the country that, that you could follow.
So uh, the well owner should consult with someone qualified in well disinfection for instruction before they would attempt to do it. Uh, at, at any rate, uh, there are so many things to consider to do this job properly. So here are some things you should know uh, about shock chlorination. Household chlorine bleach is not designed for use in drinking water. Although household bleach is widely recommended for the disinfection of drinking water wells. So we've kind of uh, we've kind of set ourselves up here for having to, to make an explanation. Bleach is readily available. Uh, sodium hypochlorite in, in uh, you know, five or six percent uh, concentrations in household bleach, uh, up to 15 percent in, in some of the stronger uh, mixes. But it's not really designed for that purpose and may present various problems. Bleach is not designed. That's not what its application is. It's for you know, several other things, and I, I go out on a limb here and say it probably started in, in disinfecting appliances and, and uh, kitchens, uh, food handling, those kind of things uh, is where it probably more widely was applied early on, and that's uh, what it could have been uh, actually formulated for. But so you're only talking about 5 or 6% as a maximum sodium hypochlorite, and sodium is the liquid. Calcium is the solid. That's the difference between the two. In the application, it'd be tough. You'd have to dissolve a solid like we do uh, in in uh, our applications for disinfecting wells. That we would dissolve a solid in water, and then uh, so it was mo we could transport it, be mobile, and we could get it to mix really well. So the disinfective properties of bleach deteriorate over time, affecting its reliability as a disinfecting agent. So the bleach uh, as, a, as a disinfectant begins to break down actually over uh, after six months. Remember I said sodium hypochlorite. And if it starts with five or six percent, uh, it ends up after about a year uh, pretty close to zero because it just changes to salt and water over time. So it does break down. So the actual age of that half a gallon or gallon of, of household bleach, when you go and buy a, a, a gallon at the store and you use a little, use a little, you use a little, well, after a year, it's pretty ineffective at, ineffective at, uh, at killing germs. Is as it just degrades over time. So in six months, it's only really three percent. Uh, in nine months, it's one and a half. And by the time you get to twelve months, it's time to buy another bottle. So if you've got bottles that are just hanging around, they're if they've been there more than a year, it's probably time to change them out and uh, go get some new stuff because that's that's pretty well ineffective uh, as a disinfecting agent. So second, bleach may contain some perchlorate. Uh, which is a substance used in the manufacture of various products. And I'm pretty sure we don't want perchlorate in our well. We don't want it in our water supply. We don't want it anywhere near it. We're trying to keep things out of our water supplies. Uh, anything that is, that's not been tested, um, we don't want it in there. Let me get that right out of the way here. So, Research has shown that perchlorate can present a health risk at certain levels and affect iodine uptake by the human thyroid to inhibit thyroidal hormone production. I'm not a doctor. I'm only reading the screen here at this point. Uh, you know, we have to be careful what we put in. We want to use only the products necessary to disinfect our supply because anything else could possibly be harmful. And at too high a concentration, bleach can create disinfection byproducts harmful, harmful to health. So when organic matter and water comes into contact with certain chemicals, such as chlorine, a reaction can occur, which creates a disinfection byproduct known as trialomethane. And it, that's a, a, a cancer-causing agent. And that's why in any of the books that I have read on proper disinfection, uh, whether it be how many parts per million that we're using or the contact time required, 
there are very few that show any more than 200 parts per million of free chlorine. And 200 parts per million of free chlorine in a new water main would be 30 minute contact time. So it would, in 30 minutes, it would completely disinfect that water main. At 10 parts per million or more worth of free chlorine, it takes 24 hours. So you can see where the, the time volume matrix starts to come into play. So in your home, there's a couple other things that you need to, that you need to consider. It, you've got to live with this. This is going to be running through the house. It's going to be coming out of your faucets. How much chlorine do you really want coming out of your faucets? How much is necessary? So that's when we go back to the sort of the critical calculations and setting this up for success without going to excess. And that's where the water system professional can, can really uh, uh, be a hero in, well, maybe you put Maybe you put five gallons of, of household bleach in, and wow, it was really rugged for a whole week. But this guy came out and put in half a pound of, of uh, calcium hypochlorite, and in two or three days it was gone, and it wasn't quite so hard to live with. Uh, that's because you know, they've done it before. They know the calculations, and uh, they have some experience at it. So as I have found over my lifetime, you know, those kind of trial and error, too, experience uh, are very helpful in the long run helps you from making a mistake uh, that could cause an issue uh, down the road. So a too high a concentration bleach can corrode well system components. So everybody sees the sign, welcome to Flint. Well, the corrosiveness of chlorine in Flint, Michigan, where the water coming out of the public water system was caustic enough to corrode galvanized steel pipe, causing the release of toxic lead into the drinking water. So for those of you that don't know, uh, 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 chlorine solution uh, raises the pH incredibly. Uh, the pH of liquid household bleach, if my memory is correct, is somewhere greater than 10, 11 uh, on the pH scale. Uh, so whether, whether it's uh, alkaline um, or whether it's acidic, which is alkaline is a really high pH and acidic is a really, really low pH. Uh, either one of those conditions will have the water tend to absorb anything it can get its hands on. So if any of you have a green stain uh, in your sink, then your water is probably acidic. Well, that water is taking on the, the actual copper in your system. So, uh, and, and that's the green stain. So any of those conditions are, are harmful to the piping, uh, can be harmful to you. They're picking up elements uh, all, through, all through the system and they're delivering them you know, right into your, your, uh, right into your you know, water glass. So a question. The National Groundwater Association does not recommend household bleach for well disinfection because it is not designed for use in drinking water. It deteriorates over time, affecting its reliability as a disinfectant. It may contain perchlorate, which can affect the thyroid gland. So all the above or none of the above. Cliff, is this something that you are going to wait for people to chime in uh, to answer? No, we'll just let them think about it and then you can uh, give us the answer. Okay. So, you know, we went over uh, much of this stuff, uh, actually all of these questions here as we were going forward. And if you really, if you really think about it, uh, the answers have all been covered. And it, the answer is D, all the above. There are several reasons why we don't recommend um, the, the application of uh, household bleach. So when you take the top of your well apart, remove the cap, uh, other problems may result from trying to disinfect somebody's own well. As you can see in this photo, uh, there's the top of the well, that greenish colored piece right in the, see if my mouse is gonna work, right here. 
That greenish colored piece right there is called a pitless adapter. Uh, in the North Country in freezing conditions, those are installed more than five feet down uh, the side of the casing. That allows the water to come out and go into the house 12 months out of the year without fear of the water line freezing going in. Those of you in warmer climates uh, probably comes right out of the top of your well on a well seal and then is delivered to a pressure tank, sometimes even setting right outside. Uh, in, in cold climates, we have to house all that either in the building or we have a, a, a subgrade water line that goes in so it can't freeze. Well, the other piece that's sticking into the top of that, that's a, well, I call it a T-stick. It's a lift pipe, whatever you want to call it. That's a standard, usually a one-inch piece of threaded pipe that, that picks that uh, inside part of that pitless adapter up out of the well so it's exposed. I've seen several times where people tried to disinfect their own well. And when they were either putting chlorine down in their uh, tablets, some people use pool tablets, don't ever use a pool tablet that has so much other stuff and it has biocides and algicides and, and please stay away from pool tablets. Uh, they are not a good alternative either. That uh, they get them stuck in those, where those threads are and then what happens? Whether it's bleach or whether it's a chlorine tablet, and you don't recirculate it in the well to wash that all out, corrosion. Well, you look down in there and all of a sudden there's no threads in the top of that thing to be able to pick it out of the well. So the money you saved in doing this yourself just costs you $1,000 because somebody's got to come out and dig up a pitless adapter uh, because they can't screw into it or they got to come out and try to fish it out of there with a tool that they've made or something else. So, you know, there are, and that, there are several other things that can happen also. Uh, but that being one of them, I mean, you've got electrical wires that go down in there. Uh, you also, you know, look at what's on the ground around you. There's coliform bacteria everywhere. So anything you touch on the ground is going to have coliform bacteria. We have it naturally occurring on our hands as well. So you have to be, you have to really take care to disinfect the whole inside of the well, all the way to the top of the casing, the cap. The wires, everything that comes out of the top and the inside of the well cap. You have to disinfect all of that because in any of these areas, coliform bacteria can be living on any of those surfaces. And that is a, that's a nice looking finished wellhead. You can look down to the lower left hand side right here. I'm going to point out the well screen, the, the actual air intake screens right here. And it's a nice tight fitting cap. And it looks like it's got a gasket that goes on there when they get ready to put it back together. It's got a nice rubber O ring that, when you bolt it down, seals the top of it very, very well. Uh, that's very important. So, we'll sort of rehash if the disinfectant is not at the proper concentration for the volume of water in the well system. Where the contact time between the disinfectant and the system is not sufficiently long, the disinfection process may not work. We talked about that matrix of percentage of free chlorine and the time component. It takes time. The less the percentage is, the longer the time that it has to contact with the bacteria, with the minerals to get through the layers of scale. We think of a, a, a water well, there are layers of minerals that build up around the water level where the water level goes up and down. You will get some mineralization build up there. It'll turn from a solution into a solid and bacteria can live in those layers. So you've got to get all of that. And, it, and this just takes some time. So when do you disinfect your well? Well, it's important anytime a well is open, serviced, or if water test results indicate the presence of bacteria. The other thing that I might add into there is if there's a change in taste or odor in your well. That, uh, you know, is another indicator where something has changed. Maybe we should go and take a look at this thing. At least sample it. Even if you don't start right off with disinfection, take a sample of it. Check it for potability. And then if it fails potability, you're going to have to go and you're going to have to shock it. So when bacteria is persistent after disinfection, well, it should be determined whether there's a breach in the well system allowing surface water or bacteria-laden groundwater to enter the well system. 
before the water has been properly filtered by the ground. Here's a great example right here of a terrible cap. That is absolutely a terrible well cap. There's no screen, there's no gaskets. See where the rope is kind of hanging out of it? Spiders, caterpillars, uh, earwigs, mice. Um, we, uh, we find uh, a, a whole bunch of, of things go wrong when the top of your well is open to the environment. It's, it's anything can get in there. We call that a candy dish cap. That blue cap right there with those three, it's got usually three or four set screws on it that is open, probably a 1 one sixteenth, one thirty second to one sixteenth area of opening right here. Uh, and this front part up here where your wire comes in is usually got plenty of opening right there. The only thing that those should be used for is to be turned upside down on somebody's desk to dispense candy to their customers or employees. Um, everything that we do uh, and in the state of Vermont is mandated it has to be a gasketed, sealed, vented cap. So those, hopefully nobody has any of those on their wells, uh, but I, I still see them today and we change them very, very regularly. That is a, a huge culprit of coliform. So at too high a concentration, bleach can interact with organic matter in groundwater to create a uh, triomethane, sorry Cliff, I'm having a little trouble pronouncing here today, uh, a cancer-causing agent, cause corrosion of galvanized steel pipe, uh, possibly releasing toxic lead, both the above, none of the above. So we, we've covered a lot of ground, and as we think back over the slides, that too high a concentration raises the pH in the water so that it becomes aggressive and it becomes caustic. So it can interact with organic matter and it can cause corrosion. And it also can grab onto elements that are in the piping and, and carry it through to your home. So the answer to this one here is C, and that's both of the above. So well cap removal is not a concern if it is placed on a clean surface during well disinfection and quickly reinstalled afterward. I very briefly touched on that, but I, I believe I reiterated several times that every surface, every applicant that's in this well, the wire, uh, everything that's in there needs to be disinfected uh, at the time that you're doing the, the, the big you know, circulatory uh, disinfection of the water supply. So that answer is false. You have to disinfect it. You have to disinfect all that casing all the way to the top, the inside of the cap, the top edge of the cap, everything inside the O-ring. Uh, you, you really can't go too far with making sure that things are, are really, really clean and a, a very thorough disinfection. So if a disinfectant is not at the proper concentration for the volume of water in the well system, the disinfection process may not work. But we did talk about that matrix of amounts of free chlorine, part per million or MCL of, of free chlorine at being a minimum of 10 parts per million of free chlorine uh, in a longer period of time disinfection process or to up to 200 parts per million of chlorine in a shorter duration disinfection process or application. So if you don't have enough free chlorine, then it will not disinfect everything. You don't have enough free chlorine, you don't have enough available to kill all the bacteria. So that, that answer is true. So if the contact time between a disinfectant and the well system is not sufficient, the disinfection process may not work. Right back to that matrix again. If we have 200 parts per million in 30 minutes in a new piece of piping, more than that in existing, because we're gonna have some layers of mineralizing mineral buildup. 50 parts per million is somewhere where we start and we recommend 50 parts per million in 24 hours. We very seldom go to 200 parts per million, just to, time is 
more on our side and 200 parts per million is a pretty rugged concentration to have coming out of your faucets inside your house. So you really don't want that. If you're doing new piping outside that's not hooked up to the house, then you can certainly uh, hit it with high high levels and it really doesn't affect you. But what really gets your attention is a 200 part per million shocking. Uh, so uh, again, the, the, the contact time uh, is another critical el element of uh, disinfection. So what happens when bacteria is, is persistent as, after disinfection? Uh, should we be looking for a breach in the well system? Because we, coliform bacteria most generally will come from a surface environment where it can get oxygen and has an environment that it likes to live in. But there's a, there's a, a couple other things too to consider. Um, and it's actually, it's true, a breach in a well system could allow surface water or bacteria laden groundwater to enter the well system before the water has been properly filtered by the ground. One of the other things that I see are lines in a home uh, of a dead end. Uh, I had a bathroom over in this corner of the house and I did away with that bathroom and I capped the pipes and I've got a 25 foot long piece of half inch copper that goes over to this side of the house. It doesn't go anywhere. Well, when you're running this all through your system in a complete disinfection, the issue is, is that that heavily chlorinated water is never going to make it down that line because you're not going to allow it to. It's a dead end. So dead ends are bad. So that would, that, those are the first places that I go looking if we have a failed sample. Uh, are there, is there an area that we didn't completely get? Is there a line that goes out to a horse barn that we forgot to run? Is there another line to a yard hydrant out somewhere in the ground that we forgot to run? Are there dead ends in the home? Did we run enough through the hot water heater to increase the parts per million high enough to free chlorine to, you know, to more than 10 for 24 hours in that complete you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 gallon uh, hot water heater? So you've got a volume that you have to pull through there in order to adequately disinfect that. Because at the inlet of a hot water heater, the temperatures are really nice for bacteria. And uh, I'm sure that that's where we've had some fail over the years is by not running enough through that hot water heater. So again, you know, when possible, use a water well system professional who knows proper disinfection uh, procedure. So if we, if I go back, I want to just go back through these really quickly. Well, there's a nice little hole in the casing right there from corrosion, from external corrosion. Uh, that could be that could be the element K9P glyph, uh, or it could be something else that was leaning up against it uh, that uh, that ate that hole through the through the casing. But you look right here. See those little guys right there? I don't know how many times I've been to a a well and service the pump and the people didn't have a clue that they had a hole in the uh, somewhere around the cap that one of those little critters could get in a hole in the side of the casing like that could allow squirrels and snakes and you name it in uh, i was out on a sunday morning service call up here in underhill vermont and the conduit to the cap was broken and shifted to the side so there's a Pretty sizable hole there was an inch and a quarter conduit so I pulled the cap off not really knowing what I was going to find and I found a beautiful mouse nest about the size of a softball uh, right there on top of the wires so I dug that out it was full of grass and leaves and uh, as you can imagine mouse droppings and it smelled really nice and I dug all that out and there was a great big ball of it that's, that was down in the well on top of the pitless adapter. So I can't even see what I'm doing down in there. I put the, uh, the T-stick down in and I fooled around with it long enough to when I was pretty sure I was into the threads of the top of the pitless adapter because I was sort of doing this blind. And I hitched into it and I picked it up and got it to the top of the well and I pulled that whole nest up. And the reason they'd called certainly is they didn't have any water. And what I had found is that there was a whole family of mice living in the top of the well, and they had chewed the PVC coating off from the wires uh, all the way down to the water level in, in several areas. And 
as a result, the wires got together from them being down in there and it, it shorted the control box out and burnt the wires off. So we decided we were going to pull the pump all the way out because uh, pumps have cable guards and torque arresters. They have you know, little things on them to center them in the borehole and keep when the pump comes on uh, from uh, too much torque and wearing through the wires. Well, they had sort of gnawed on that wire all the way down to the top of the water level, which is about 35 feet. So I got about 100 feet out, and up comes a cable guard with a mouse carcass on it. It had been in the water. So as I continued to pull it, everything was covered with mouse droppings, and it had grass and leaves. So we were cleaning and wiping things down. We actually used household bleach to wipe it down because it was easier to use. And you know, we, we disinfected the water pipe as it came out, and then certainly as it went back in, and uh, you know, we certainly fixed the cat. But those people had been drinking water that was full of mouse poop, had dead mice in it uh, for what could have been years, certainly was months uh, from what I saw. So if you have a condition like that, if you have a cap like that, or if you have a condition in the top of your well that you can readily see is large enough to let uh, out, outside uh, elements in, uh, whether they be earwigs, spiders, mice, you name it, uh, that, uh, you know, be aware of that. Those are something that a, that a homeowner can look at. And, and keep that well safe. If you notice anything with color or smell or taste or or anything like that, you know the first thing that you should be doing is testing these wells or consulting with a water well professional in your area to get some advice on it. And you know one of the things we didn't cover is when you're when we're shocking cycling a well and we're completely disinfecting everything. There is an, there's an electrocution hazard there too, because you've got wires most of the time in a submersible well pump application, certainly all the time, that go down to the pump that run the pump. And there's 220 volts going through there. So you have to be very mindful. If you have wire nuts that hold the wires together and you get a heavy chlorine solution in there and you don't rinse it out well, then you're gonna have corrosion and you're gonna have system failure because uh, those wires are gonna burn off, they're gonna burn off in short order. So uh, you have to be very mindful of several things uh, when you're doing this. And that's, you know, just one of the many reasons why we recommend that a, you know, a water system professional uh, goes out and, and does this. Because there's things that, that we have seen, things that we've done, the practices that we use are streamlined and have been refined over the years to, to make it much more successful. So if you want to learn more uh, about this, wellowner.org, private well owner hotline, private well owner tip sheet, NGWA has just done great things with all of this information for homeowners and groundwater professionals, just, you know, just like myself. I turned to NGWA, I, I, I've been a, a member for you know, a number of years and uh, and I'm currently the past president of the organization, and I have found uh, the information that's put out by this organization to be second to none. It's been a great organization to be involved with, and it's taught me a lot, and it does a lot for homeowners. So my hat's off to the National Groundwater Association for, for all it does for, for, the, for the public homeowner. So don't forget to check wellowner.org for other online lessons. If you have questions like, what should I test my water for? How should I maintain my well? How can I help keep my water safe? What should I do if my well floods? We have a whole sheet on disinfection after a flooding event. It's a, we have a best suggested practice. How do I get water treatment guidelines uh, for that? And what should I know about getting a new well without hiring a contractor? What should you, what kind of questions should you be asking? So thank you very much for joining the webinar here today. Um, thank you to the National Groundwater Association and Cliff for inviting me to, uh, to present this webinar and for RCAP uh, for helping to support this webinar. So Cliff, uh, I think I'm probably done. Uh, we, I guess we have we time have for some questions. We do, we have questions. And uh, one picks right up on uh, some of the, um, uh, information we're providing about concentration of chlorine. The question is, 
would, would you recommend 50 parts per million for 24 hours in the event of flood water contamination? Uh, I think flood water contamination may take long, uh, may take more and may take longer than that. And I'd have to look at what the BSP, but if you've got flood water, the first thing you've got to do is pump that out. You've got to get that, all the sediment and all that other, all the debris out of there. That's one of the first things in that BSP uh, that it talks about. And we've had them in Vermont. We've had uh, Hurricane Irene that flooded a whole bunch of water wells and, and shallow wells and springs and just really wreaked havoc up here. So the first thing to do is to bump it out and get all the debris out. And then, um, you know, I, I would use at least 50 parts per million of flood event, uh, probably, especially if the, the building was uninhabited for a period of time. Um, I, might, I might increase that concentration to a little higher than that. I might go to 100 parts per million, let it set for 24 hours, and then start pumping it out. Uh, and I, I'm, again, if somebody's living in it, maybe I would keep it at that level for a little bit longer you have to pump out the debris and you have to pump out the sediment so that you don't have other contamination in there that you didn't bargain for. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another question. Is it practical to add a chlorination system if your well water is stored in a ground level tank and sent to the house with a boost pump? Uh, so that's for disinfecting the water coming out of a atmospheric storage tank um, what it sounds what like. we yeah uh, we do uh, sometimes chlorinate chlorine injection uh, can be tough chlorine injection pumps there's some really on there's some O&M there there's some maintenance that's required on those well it will disinfect it but you sort of need to take that chlorine back out of it because chlorine ingestion really isn't very good for you so if you're going to chlorinate, you need to dechlorinate. Uh, if what we look at sometimes in a booster system out of an atmospheric storage tank is what's the water quality and does it fit the parameters of a UV light? And that's the way that we handle it because a UV light has its own set of alarms. A bulb is good for a year. It's pretty low maintenance. It's not a lot of money to put in. And, you know, you've got some peace of mind with it. But water quality, uh, you know, TDS, hardness, iron, manganese levels, all those things start to feed into that. So you could either chlorinate, dechlorinate, but then to chlorinate is to put the chlorine in, to dechlorinate is to use a carbon filter after the fact to pull the chlorine back out. So you've got a couple things working. So it, it really application driven. Do you need to chlorinate it for some other reason? So other than bacteria. So I'd let that drive my decision whether I chlorinated it, dechlorinated it, or whether I put a UV light on. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a question about, uh, you were talking about uh, um, having contact time with water in all parts of the system. You mentioned a hot water heater and those dead end pipes. What about the pressure tank? Well, the pressure tank through the cycling of the well pump, if there's when you're recirculating back into the top of the well, the pressure tank is going to take on water, it's going to give water back. It's going to take on water, it's going to give water back. Through every cycle, depending on the size of your tank, it's going to ingest anywhere from maybe six gallons in a cycle back into that tank, and then it's going to give it back, and then it's going to take it on again. Uh, might be from six gallons to maybe 20 gallons. So through the cycle time of the tank, it should it should continuously replace the water that's in there and disinfect the pressure tank. Okay. Um, here's a question. Most people I know disinfect their own wells. I've figured this is something I could do to save money. What does it cost to have a well driller disinfect my well? Well, in our world, uh, it's about $300 up here uh, for a driller to come out and you know, go through the hour, hour and a half uh, disinfection process. We do, we spend a fair amount of time at it to be very, very thorough. So my assumption is in parts of the country, you could get it anywhere from a, you know, $150, $200 to depending on how long the travel time is and whether there's any work in that area, uh, you know, you could have you know, three to $500 in it. I know a friend of mine in Texas drives farther to get his coffee every morning than I do to drill wells. So 
he uh, he may be a little bit more down there than we are, and then there may be areas of the country where you know, we're working right next door. You know, 150 bucks will disinfect it. So that kind of would be my idea of scale. Okay, thanks. Um, here's a question: Is it even possible to keep bacteria out of a well system? It seems awfully difficult. Uh, and I would add on to that: you're you're mentioning all the different ways that that bugs and so forth can get into well. So I guess the the viewer is wondering: Is it really even possible to any great degree? We have wells that stay bacteria free for long, long periods of time. Some some wells that were drilled 15 years ago, they take a sample for a, a closing, you know, on the house to, to test the water, and it comes back clean 15 years later. But that means there was no breaches in that. There was never a spider that got in there. So yes, it's incredibly difficult. Yes, you should continuously monitor this stuff uh, because that just that one little breach that nobody saw, that one little gap, and you've got a bacteria problem. Over time, I mean, it can, it can happen in a water supply. Somebody's drilling a well next door. Somebody constructs a house next door and blasts a ledge that opens up something new into your well. So my recommendation is, is that uh, you, know, you periodically test your supply to verify that everything is okay. Don't rely on, on just what you see. Okay, thank you. Um... How would I know if I have a persistent bacteria problem if no one in my household is getting sick? You mentioned that the people with the mice in their well um, been, might have been drinking this for years. Uh, we, of course, I, I don't know if you know if anyone got sick, but what about uh, this idea that um, I've been drinking the water for years, never gotten sick? Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they don't have bacteria, right? And what's, Why is that? Well, there's several forms of, of uh, coliform bacteria that aren't harmful. You know, coliform is a major rule, isn't harmful. We, you know, you have bacteria on your hands, uh, lick your fingers, meat and french fries or something like that. You've taken on some harmless uh, coliform bacteria. It's the E. coli, uh, you know, form from, you know, human, animal, feces, those kind of things uh, that will really make you sick. Uh, we've all heard of uh, uh, beaver fever. Uh, you know, there, there, there's several cystic uh, uh, organisms that, that are harmful. But there's a general rule, uh, coliform isn't harmful, but it's an indicator that there may be something else going on. So, and I see it all the time. People that are drinking water out of springs, shallow wells, uh, when you take the cover off, you go, ooh, I was drinking that, but nobody got sick. So, you know, there's just a several strains that aren't harmful. But you don't know that. And, uh, until you're sick. So best to keep an eye on it. Okay. Um, why? Uh, here's a question. Why is bleach so widely recommended by other people if it's not safe or effective to use? So there's kind of, they're kind of wondering why that is. Well, that, you know, I guess probably my assumption would be is it's handy something available right off the shelf it's something that you know most everybody's got underneath the counter uh we got some bleach and it disinfects the countertops why wouldn't it disinfect my water supply but you know, with the other elements of it and the uh uncertainty of its effectiveness and and what the percentage of sodium hypochlorite is in that bottle of bleach because well i don't really remember when i bought it and there's nothing on it that says it's dated so well, we'll just dump it in there you know, it, it, it just is pretty marginally effective and can have some consequences. So, you know, NGWA recommends it to, to use you know, calcium hypochlorite and, and you dispense it in, in the right volumes and uh, do it in the right procedure. So it's just a better, it's a better mousetrap. All right. Speaking of mice, um, somebody wants to know, um, uh, it would have to be a pretty big hole for a mouse to get into a well, wouldn't it? So how big of a opening does a mouse need to get inside a well? I, I've seen them get into some incredibly small spaces. Uh, th this hole that I was talking about had a number 10-3 PVC wire that went up through there. 
and it was inch and a quarter PVC. So it had no more than a, maybe a half inch gap in it. And that melt was in that whole family was living in there uh, through no more than a half inch opening. And I've seen it time and time and time again, where you're like, I don't know how they got in there, but they're there. So it, it, it doesn't take much of an open opening. There was one year, oh gosh, this is probably 15 or 20 years ago here in Vermont, where we had a terrible infestation of earwigs in all of our supplies. So what happened, it was really, really small holes for these other bugs to get in. When the earwig infestation was so bad that we had to pull the pump and we had to put pipe down in there and we actually had to blow the water out of this well and clean it up to get all the earwigs out of it. And the ground was covered with dead earwigs. So even a very small, uh, very, very small hole, eighth of an inch gap or something like that is big enough for an earwig or a spider or something like that. And then you know, like a mouse, you know, three eighths, half inch, doesn't take much of a, an area for one of the, those critters to find their way in. Yeah, just as an aside, uh, I had a mouse infestation in my house one time. I finally had to call the uh, the uh, varmint people, and uh, the guy told me that um, a mouse can squeeze itself through a, like a quarter inch opening. They and I, I don't I don't know if that's true, but I, my sense was that they are very malleable and can can really kind of squeeze their body through unnaturally small openings. So. That would that might explain it. Um, so so uh, I have a question here, uh, which I think you've answered the first part about what kind of corrosion can bleach cause in a well system. But the second part is, and how quickly can uh, serious corrosion happen? So is this a long, years-long process, or can it happen rather quickly? Well, it can ha I, it can happen very quickly with something that high pH. That's just automatically begins attacking uh, everything it can find uh, to turn it into solution just starts grabbing everything so you know very quickly you know within 24 48 hours i mean that stuff the, that heavy chlorine solution has picked up a whole bunch of things on its in its journey down through there because if in three or four days it's gone then your ph levels have returned to normal within a ph uh, a neutral ph is seven so if in four or five days, so you think of when when it can leach, grab onto the, the lead or it can grab onto any other minerals and make it mobile uh, would happen during that, that period of time right there. Okay, thanks. Uh, here's a safety question. You mentioned safety risks in using bleach or disinfectants. What kind of uh, safety risk? Um, uh, you uh, and they're wondering if you mean uh, like chlorine gas. So you mentioned uh, corrosiveness, but are uh, what what are the range of uh, risk in using those something like chlorine? Well, anytime you use uh, you know, an agent, an oxidizing agent like that with a as high a pH as they have, certainly uh, exposure to skin uh, over time it'll burn you. Uh, when I send someone out to do a disinfection, they have uh, rubber gloves and they have uh, safety glasses and a, a face shield if we think it's necessary. And a lot of times I'll, I'll have them even wear an apron just to keep it off their clothes so that they don't end up with a whole bunch of white spots on their clothes. Uh, but And the inhalation hazard, as I, I'm actually right in the middle of a disinfection procedure right now in, at a, a friend of mine has uh, an iron bacteria problem and he has a reoccurring bacteria problem. And I think the iron bacteria buildup is what has been harboring the bacteria issue. So we're treating it for iron bacteria. So I am, I've got a truck there and I'm letting very heavily chlorinated water uh, down in there to keep the solution really heavy for 48 hours. And I have to use, you know, uh, pure uh, CCH, uh, calcium hypochloride, 65% mixed up in a thousand gallon tank. Um, I took the cover off from the the chlorine pellet jug that I have and I held it way, way from me, but it still nearly made my eyes water. So 
you know, the, you know, it burns your lungs, it get it in your eyes. Uh, you know, that's not a good day either. It burns pretty well. So from the safety point of view, you have to be really, really careful with these disinfecting agents. What else you got, Cliff? You got it on mute? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I knew I was going to do that. Uh, <laughs> the question is, how many times should you professionally disinfect a well before you decide to to install UV? That's oh, probably three, maybe three or four times. Uh, depends. So if we take a sample and we don't do a coliform colony count, let's say we don't have E. coli, uh, we, we take a sample and it has bacteria, either before or after being shock chlorinated. So sometimes just a sample out of the faucet and they say, well, we got coliform. I say, well, what was your colony count? We don't know, we didn't have it counted. So, okay, well, we're gonna come out and we're gonna shock and cycle it and then we're gonna take another sample. And we're gonna do a colony count. So let's say that colony count is 200. And after the shock and cycle, uh, we, get a, we get a 200 colony count. So ooh, we got a pretty bad deal going on. So OK, we're going to shock it and cycle it one more time. And then we're going to do another colony count. So if the colony count stays at really high, then we know we got a, we're pretty sure we got a problem somewhere. If I, not, if I cut it back to you know, 10 to 50, well, I'm getting it. There's some bad mineral incrustation down there. There's an area we're not getting to very effectively. So let's hit it a little harder for a little bit longer and let's do it again. So that tends to give me information to, to either uh, change the application and, and do something different to do a point of use system or to continue working on the supply to try to figure out where my bacteria is coming from. So there's you know different applications. If I have E. coli, then I immediately go and I don't see something in the well that caused me to believe the E. coli was coming from a critter that was in there, um, then I immediately go to, we got a breach here somewhere. We got a real problem uh, because E. coli is an indicator of something much, much bigger, uh, animal or human uh, waste. So uh, it depends on, on what I find and how long I find it, but usually by the third or fourth time, we're doing something different to ensure that the people have safe water. Um, I, I want to add on a question to that about the UV. Um, uh, what what would you consider to be um, wise use of UV light? Because uh, you seem to be saying if you've got a persistent problem, you want to disinfect and get rid of it. Um, so would UV be primarily a backup, or how? What what guidelines would you suggest for somebody in terms of deciding? Uh, um, generally whether or not to use uv light uvs are are great tools when you can't solve it another way by fixing what the problem is it's a, it's a tool it's just one of the tools we have in our our toolbox your water quality issue uh whether it be with hardness or iron or manganese you have to really be careful when putting in a UV that that water is really, really good in order for the RV to be, uh, UV to be 100% uh, effective. So I use them as a tool and I can't find a reasonable solution any other way. Um, and, and sometimes it just, if you have a surface supply, uh, you would automatically put a UV light on it to protect you uh, in the instance of, of coliform bacteria. But in a deep well situation, uh, most of the time, we can fix that uh, unless it's coming from a, a source that we have no control over. So that's when I would use a UV light. Okay. Uh, I have one more question. Somebody uh, wants to know what is used as a disinfectant other than bleach? I think you've made some references, but can you describe a little bit more what the um, some of the um, disinfectants that are authorized for use in drinking water that uh, are considered um, safe in terms of uh, mixing with potable water? Well, the, the, the bleach certainly, like I talked, was uh, sodium hypochlorite 
and uh, the pellet style uh, is calcium hypochlorite. Now you need to use those in the, the calcium hypochlorite, you need to use it in its pure form, uh, CCH, with no other additives, no biocides, algicides, or anything else added into it that would take care of other elements other than just raising the pH and uh, oxidizing the elements that it came in contact with. There is another, uh, there is another product out there that we've been using some that's NSF approved, um, and uh, that is uh, a, a, an alternative to chlorine that doesn't oxidize the minerals quite as much. It won't attack iron bacteria and those things. But for the most part, I think that uh, you know, pure calcium hypochlorite uh, is, is, in my recommendation, uh, until I until I watch this other product a little bit more, probably what I would recommend that people would use in the right concentrations. All right. Well, Jeff, uh, we want to thank you for an excellent, excellent presentation. And I want to thank everybody who uh, tuned in to hear this. Um, if you didn't notice, uh, the handout of this uh, PowerPoint is in the handout box on, uh, in your little panels there. You should be able to it's a PDF, you should be able to download that. So please, uh, if you want to do that, do that now. And um, uh, also this webinar was recorded. And so the, uh, the link to that recording should be up in a day or two. And I would encourage you if you have friends or colleagues that you want to share this with, uh, uh, get that link and, and share it with them. And um, so again, I want to thank everyone uh, for participating and uh, check out wellowner.org for tons more information about uh, how to uh, test water, maintain your well system, well construction, groundwater protection, or a whole range of issues. So with that, we'll bring it to a close and thank you very much. Good afternoon. Bye.